I want to dedicate what I'm uh, here to say to two people. The first is Drew Scalzi, a man from this community who taught me a tremendous amount about you, and I want to thank you for the gift of him and his service, and to Ted Stevens, a man who is my mentor and who taught me a lot about resilience in communities. So to begin, sustainability. It's something we're talking about here today, a useful concept, but um, somewhat inadequate when we're talking about uh, communities and the foundations of them. Part of the problem is that when you think about sustainability, you immediately come to the point of asking of what, for whom, and for how long. And as I got into energy policy, I realized right away that this was an, an, an inadequate way to analyze the question of energy policy in our state because you had winners and losers that came out right away. Better was the concept of resilience. Life isn't static. Um, we want our communities to continue to grow and change, and as has been referenced in other um, speeches here today, that it's often through the crisis itself that we grow and move on. Um, human beings find places that they enjoy living, that have good quality of life, and they want their children to have that quality of life. This is a picture of myself and my son Grayson, who's four years old. A lifelong Alaskan, and I moved back home um, with many choices of places to live with a Juris Doctorate, and it was fundamentally the fact that I wanted to live and raise my children here in this place. At the heart of every community is energy. It's the foundation of an economy. It's the foundation of a society. And so it's from there that people choose their places to live. Um, one main proposition that I have as I've gone out um, through Alaska to form our energy policy is the premise that Alaskans want to live and work where energy is available, reliable, and affordable. In 19, uh, uh, pardon me, in 2008, I had an opportunity to go to Iceland this is a life-changing uh, <coughs> trip for me. It's similar to Alaska. Its population is 380,000 people, roughly the size of Anchorage, Alaska. It's isolated and remote. It has a cold climate. Um, people there love the place. There are generations after generations that have been living there. They can point to their uh, homes that their family have built. It reminded me of my home and caused me to do some deep introspection. As we know, energy prices are volatile, and in 1974, when the oil shocks hit the world, they hit Iceland in a particularly profound way. That small island nation had no hydrocarbons of, of their own, and they were completely reliant on outside sources. Um, they were cut off from the rest of the world and faced the death of their own society. Once again, resilience was not a possibility. So during the 1980s, while the rest of us um, were back into our hydrocarbon-induced stupor, Iceland had invested in renewable energy. And um, yet again, in uh, 19, or 2008, when um, oil prices shot up and you saw Alaska hurting, Alaskan homes hurting, we could look over to Iceland to see that 100% of its electricity was coming from renewable energy. 90% um, of its home heating was coming from renewable energy. Two main sources there, and hydroelectric and geothermal. But this is a small community like us that had taken matters into their own hands, had taken a very real crisis and turned it into an opportunity. I came back home to Alaska with that very real experience in my hand and decided that one um, young, youngest member of the Senate, Alaskan, could make a difference. And in my time in the Senate, I wanted to do that. So as chair of the Senate Energy Committee, I decided that we would set out to travel around Alaska first. Leadership is listening and then taking action after you listen. We went around the state. We were in places as far as Ruby and Tanana and as near as Fairbanks and Kodiak. And I can remember uh, testimony from the principal in Tanana in particular where he said to us with tears in his eyes that his main goal every day was to try and get higher graduation rates for those students in Tanana so that they could have a better opportunity in life, and yet 70 cents on every dollar um, that he was trying to put into the classroom was going into his energy um, bills. Very real. We went to Fairbanks, <coughs> and um, what we saw there was devastating families that had gone into bankruptcy in 2008, as I uh, mentioned, when uh, Iceland had already gone to renewables. We, even after the oil shocks of 1974, didn't learn the lesson. And when oil shut up to $147 a barrel, many of our communities are still on diesel. Fairbanks is the largest northern city in the world still on diesel, right here in Alaska. 
I saw that and said to myself, that's got to change. The irony, of course, is that Fairbanks sits just 14 miles away from the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, a pipeline that provides 14% of domestic oil production for the United States. So what we've been doing is not working. This here shows the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. We're all familiar with that image. What you see to the right is the production curve of that particular pipeline. As we sit here today, we've gone from 2.1 barrels a day to 647,000 barrels a day. Our economy is 89% dependent on that. And as I said before, we're still no closer to any off-tank points or any um, measurable um, benefit that comes directly from that pipeline in the form of energy to Alaskans. So we've started our journey. Um, this past year, we put together uh, an energy policy, the first ever um, here in the state of Alaska. And I want to thank you here in the room that were a part of that. Many Alaskans were. We um, have set the most ambitious standards for, uh, in the United States. We're asking for 50% of our um, energy to be renewable by the year 2025. We're also asking for an increase in energy efficiency of 10 to 15% by the year 2020. We've put in uh, very, very ambitious goals, but a lot of tools to help us get there. We have two revolving loan programs that are unlike anything else in the United States. One uh, is administered through our Housing Finance Corporation, and it's leveraging $250 million, allowing schools, like I discussed, Tanana, municipalities, and states to access that uh, revolving loan fund to make energy retrofits to help bring down the cost of energy. We have a second loan fund that's set up for small businesses throughout our state. It's difficult for small businesses um, to get conventional loans for the energy retrofitting, so that's a part of it. Our strategy needs to be one that's holistic, and three areas that I focused on that we already have state law um, in effect. The first is regulatory reform. Renewable energy is competitive, and prior to um, Senate Bill 277, we had additional regulatory hurdles here in our state. So figuring out what those barriers are for renewable energy companies to come to our state is very important. Next, venture capital. As I said before, um, it's very difficult for renewable energy companies to get that much needed venture capital. So we have set up two um, <coughs> renewable energy grant funds here in the state. One, we put $25 million in to help fund provide that seed corn for renewable energy projects in the state. The second has $2.4 million in it for emerging energy technology. This is the cutting edge technology that's out there um, waiting to make uh, brave breakthroughs. Um, Ruby hydrokinetic project here in Alaska is a great example. If you could see the full picture there, it's a boat with a fish wheel on the back of it. Um, that wheel turns and is, is today, this summer, um, provides all of the electrical generation needed for the town of Ruby during the summertime. The final is loans, as I mentioned before, not just grant money, but loans. The Heidelberg Small Hydro Project is an example of one of the loan beneficiaries from the loans I talked about. Mm -hmm. But these are the three areas that I think Alaska can move um, into the spot of being, we hope, the renewable energy leader for the country. Alaska isn't the state. Um, it isn't the state itself that's going to do it. It's going to be you right here in the room, Alaskans. I wanted to highlight here, this is my final slide, the Cordova Biogas Project. This is a partnership, as you can see, but part of that seed money came from that emerging grant um, program that I talked to you about. These students have taken um, household-scale biogas digesters and adapted them to cold climate. They're taking food scraps from their school lunchroom <coughs> and they are powering their school. Um, what I hope we're doing is starting a movement um, and I think that's the reason that Kat asked me to speak when she heard me um, speak at one of the women's energy conferences. It takes people time after time to come through and recognize that um, change has to be made. And a state like Alaska, I think, can be a leader. Um, as I saw in Iceland, um, a people much like us that love our state, that have generation after generation living here because we choose to. And it's incumbent on us to make this place as resilient as possible, not necessarily sustainable. As I said before, there are some winners and losers in that. But to be resilient and to know that when we pass on uh, the next generation, our next 50 years of statehood, um, that we hope that uh, when oil shocks hit, 
when prices go up to $100, uh, $147 a barrel, um, that our communities will be sustainable. So um, if Alaska can lead the way, we hope that we can start a movement that will um, entice the rest of the United States to join us as well and not send our money overseas. <laughs>